I'm Caroline Waite. I'm going to be reading from a book by Louise Brown, What Memories Are Made Of, the first few pages. The chapel is lined with apple trees, small trees, three to the left and three to the right of the altar. The scent of their fruit mingles with the sweet, dusty odour of the building. The apple trees flank two coffins. The coffins bear a married couple, Carlin and Hermann, who died soon after one another. Two coffins are unusual for a funeral service, but I don't find the sight disconcerting. It's comforting, actually, to know that a couple who spent more than 60 years together will be given a final farewell together too. The coffins are decorated with roses, sunflowers and apples. Sunbeams fall through the stained glass window above the altar, bathing everything in a warm light. I stand at the lectern and gaze at the empty pews. In a few minutes, they will be filled with the relatives and friends of the deceased. My heart beats faster at the thought that as a funeral celebrant, it is my privilege to give the couple's farewell speech. I will stand at the pastor's lectern and officiate throughout the ceremony. In my eulogy, I will talk about the life and death of these two people. As always, I hope that I can help ease a little of the relative's pain, that I can support them on their path into their new life without the deceased. There is no formula for a perfect eulogy, but when a daughter says she feels as though her father was present at the ceremony and that she found this comforting, or when a guest asks me whether I knew the deceased, then I know that my words have touched at least some of my listeners, or that some of those present have recognised themselves and their loved one in them, and that these words have created some semblance of familiarity, at least for the duration of the ceremony, at a time when so much seems alien to the bereaved. It takes more than data and facts to write a good eulogy, I think, but what images and snapshots from a person's life should be added to the facts? Which memories are the right ones, the most important ones? Which ones will make it feel almost as though the person is present at this moment? In this at times painful yet wonderful role, I have thought about these questions more and more often. What memories should we hold on to? What do we want to remember? What remains of us when we die? What do we leave behind? Several months after the service, I'm standing at a market stall buying apples. As I hold one in my hand, I can't help thinking of Carlin and Hermann's funeral. I can smell the apples on the little trees and see the soft light on the coffins. And then another image comes to mind. A house on the outskirts of a small North German town. Fruit trees in neat rows outside the windows. I see a living room and a rug that has been rolled back and middle-aged couples dancing the foxtrot to a popular song on the bare wooden boards. It is in this living room that I sat with the family before the funeral. Before a eulogy, I meet with the relatives to gather information and thoughts on the deceased. In Carlin and Hermann's case, I spoke to their adult children. Sitting at their parents' dining table, I noted birthdays, wedding anniversaries and death dates. I wrote the words, family farm, asparagus and pigs, and that the couple had transformed the farm into a tree nursery. I wrote that this had become their life's work, that their father preferred mealy apples and their mother crunchy ones, that they moved into adjoining rooms in a care home two weeks before they died, but were reunited only one week later. Carlin and Hermann had shared a bedroom for 63 years. They died within a few days of one another. As the sunlight fell across the coffins in the chapel, I told their story, describing how they had lived for their nursery, how hard work and a sense of duty had governed the course of their lives, just as the seasons governed the flourishing of the trees, and how they had followed the same daily routine for decades. Rising at dawn, serving lunch for their employees at midday, and at the end of the day enjoying their sandwiches in front of the television. And I recalled how on Friday evenings they would drop everything and dance with their friends in their living room to the music of the singer James Last until, in my mind at least, the stars twinkled above the fields. I can still see this image today when I'm at the market buying apples. It still warms my heart.
Carlin's and Hermann's story was one of my first as a celebrant, and perhaps that is why I was so moved by it. It showed me that we are often more than we appear to be, that we all have surprising and contradictory sides to us, and that it is death that sometimes reveals these idiosyncrasies. Experiencing a loss can make us take a break from the frantic pace of everyday life and take a closer look at what is around us. Then, sometimes, 